All right, thank you all for joining us for the Strategies for Surviving the Thesis and Dissertation Process Workshop. Joining us today are three panelists, all former graduate students themselves and who have now graduated with their doctorate. I'll go ahead and introduce them by name and then I'll hand it over to them to talk a little bit more about themselves and then also field some of our questions. So the first panelist we have today is Dr. Jessica Nave Blodgett from Psychology. We have Dr. Joy McKenna from Biological Sciences and we have Dr. Shema Abdel Halim from Geoscience. They will be answering your questions about how to survive your thesis and dissertation process. I'm going to hand it over to them uh, for introductions, and then after that, they'll take your questions. So uh, the first one I'd like to hand it off to is Jessica. So Jessica, may you please go ahead and introduce yourself with any other details that I didn't say? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as Dustin said, my name is Jessica Nave Blodgett. I graduated from UNLV in... 2020 with my doctorate in experimental psychology. Uh, the department's now transitioned to psychological and brain sciences, but I was under the old degree program. I currently am in Phoenix, Arizona, and I work as a uh, scientific consultant in human factors. So I specialize in basically being an expert witness in litigation related matters and applying my knowledge of psychology, cognitive psychology, cognition, human behavior to understand and talk about how people behave in litigation. Thank you so much. And then I'll go ahead and hand it over to, um, to Joy next. Thank you, Dustin. Um, my name is Joy McKenna. I graduated in 2020 as well, so mid-pandemic. Um, currently, I am a postdoctoral fellow, fellow at Stanford Medical School. Um, I study how different bacterial pathogens, specifically Salmonella, Typhimurium, and Typhi, how they invade human epithelial cells. I'm particularly focused on the gastrointestinal tract um, at the moment, and that's about it. I'm happy to he be here, happy to take all of your questions. Thank you so much. And then Shema, may you please introduce yourself? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Shema Abdel Halim. Um, I received my PhD and master's from UNLV in geoscience. Uh, and then I worked as a research faculty at UNLV for some time. And then now um, I'm currently an assistant professor at Cairo University in geology. Um, and I'm happy to share my experience with you today and I hope you find it useful. Thank you so much for those introductions. And as you'll notice, the lights shut off on me, so uh, it will be a little dark on my end, but I'm glad that all of our panelists have nice lighting behind them. So as we wait for questions to come in from the audience, I have a few that I wanted to pose. And, and one of those questions I wanted to start right off the bat with is about struggles with the thesis or dissertation progress, because I'm not sure that a thesis or dissertation pro progress or pro project can go without any kind of obstacles to overcome. So the question for, for you is, what did you struggle with most while writing your thesis? or dis Well, all of you wrote dissertations, um, it seems, and then Shaima, you know, you said you had your master's too. So um, what was the biggest struggle? If you wrote both a thesis and, and dissertation at some point in your lives, um, were the struggles similar or different? And I'll leave it to any of you to decide who wants to go first. I think you can chime in with this question since I wrote both of them. Um, I think the first struggle we all we all go through is understanding how a thesis or a dissertation should look like because it's different than any writing exercise we've ever done before in high school or even in, in undergrad. It's totally different. Um, you're expected to write, um, you're expected to read tons and tons of papers and then reflect what you've learned from these papers in your dissertation and then write your own experience with your research in a certain way that reflects all the process all the scientific process that you've done um, in the research that you've done um, so i think that was the first struggle for me as an international student was also the language because writing in a different language than my first language is 
is a whole lot different journey and uh, a whole lot different thing to learn. And at UNLV, we have a lot of international students, especially grad students. Um, and this is this is also one of the struggles that we go through. Um, the other thing is um, understanding where your advisor comes from when he gives you bad feedback, because the feedback is always going to be bad, uh, at least from your point of view. Um, he, they're never going to say they they don't they don't mean bad they don't they don't mean that your thesis or dissertation is bad but we see it as bad because we get attached to what we have written, um, like we see that's the like this is the best thing we have we have ever done before, um, yeah. So I think these are the main the three main challenges that we all go through. Um, so I actually did both my master's and my PhD uh, at UNLV as well, because I got my master's as a progression step to the PhD, and I did two different styles. So my master's degree, my thesis actually kind of looked like a mini dissertation. So in psychology, we're doing an experiment, you know, you've got your MRAD style, your introduction methods, uh, uh, results, and discuss, you know, results and discussion. Um, so my master's was basically, you know, it's like, wow, here I have to take what's in a compact journal article, but now I need to do it at a much larger scope. And also it has to be single authored because in my field, in a lot of cases, you're usually co-authoring with people. So for me, one of the biggest challenges was like how, you know, I've got to do all of it by myself and figuring out the kind of the scope of what goes into it versus what doesn't go into it. And for my dissertation, I did something called the three paper format, where I had three papers, one was published, one was accepted, and one was submitted by the time that I defended my dissertation. And those papers had to kind of be stitched together with then a, uh, a introduction, bridging chapters, a concluding chapter, and then wrapped up sort of into the grad college format. So that made for a whole different set of challenges uh, in as much as I was kind of putting together multiple related, but not on identical topics, papers to sort of show the breadth of my research. I also had to juggle the fact that as, as rough as our advisor feedback can be sometimes, man, those reviewers for peer review can be even, you know, even harder. And the timeline is more out of your control in as much as journal timelines can take longer than your committee's feedback, for example. Or then you have the challenges where the committee says, well, I want you to do this, but the journal reviewers want you to do something else. So for my dissertation, one of the biggest challenges was A, wrangling together something that was gigantic and had so many moving parts, and then finding a way to synthesize that into a whole and kind of get it across the finish line. But you know, back to the beginning, I think the challenge on both of them was the same. And as much as I had to conceptualize what it is I'm doing, figure out the scope of what is included versus what is not included. And it's really hard to say, no, actually that isn't part of my dissertation or that actually isn't part of my master's because we will all wanna put everything in uh, and, and then just creating that product because this is not something that you can write in a week. This is not something you can write in a month. It takes a lot longer and then keeping going through that progress. That was def or that process, that was absolutely a struggle. I think for me, the biggest struggle was um, first figuring out what the format is. Um, so in the biological sciences, it sounds like it's it's pretty similar to <laughs> the other fields from the other panelists at the moment. You have an introduction, you have several meaty chapters, so to speak. So you have your chapters, which include a little introduction in and of themselves, and then the results of the discussion. So those are in paper format. And then after that, you have your conclusion for the entire dissertation and then the future directions. So initially, the hard part was finding out where to put everything into all of that, even though I had um, manuscripts set up at the time. Sometimes some things need to get moved around because it fits better in different chapters. Um, so that was, that was a little bit of a struggle, but I think the biggest challenge actually was sitting my butt down and writing it. <laughs> you have to have some 
you have to be very disciplined when you write your dissertation. Um, make sure to plan it out. Know what type of a writer you are. So if you're a very slow writer like myself, I'm very, very slow. I knew that I would have to start this about six to eight months out, if not further back, um, just to kind of keep the ball rolling. And then I would set little goals for myself at the end of each week, like, okay, this week you have to write so many paragraphs or so on and so forth. And then obviously that didn't happen every single week. So I also had to learn how to be forgiving. <laughs> I mean, it's a process. You learn a lot about yourself during the dissertation writing. But for me, the biggest struggle was, I would say, time and then figuring out the overall organization of the dissertation itself. Yeah, thank you so much for the insight from all three of you about that. There's so many topics that you touched on when it comes to you know, making time to write to figuring out how to fit what you need to write into the format of the graduate college, figuring out how to translate something in the format of a journal article to what the graduate college requires. There are just a lot of steps that go into writing that dissertation well, or the thesis. And so, you know, we, one thing we haven't touched on too much so far relates to what one guest here asked, and I wanted to pose this question to the three of you. How did you go about formulating and determining your research topic? Was it something that was difficult for you, or did you feel like you kind of knew early on in your program what it was you wanted to study? So for me, uh, I started speaking with my advisors in the program within the first you know, month of me arriving. And we were kind of trying to brainstorm. We knew what my interests were. We knew what their interests were. And we just were trying to, you know, we had an idea. Let's, you know, throw things against the wall, come up with an experiment. And that's what broadened into my thesis. So the idea was first year project, which leads into thesis, which then kind of gets expanded into my larger line of research, which ended up touching many things, including what ended up being in my dissertation. So I knew from very early on kind of so for my field everything's based around experiments obviously in other fields where you're um, doing more you know literature-based scholarly analysis literature analysis then it, it will be different and i can't speak to that as much but for for my program everything's based around like what research are you doing and that research that you're doing is what's going to lead into your thesis and to your dissertation that being said then figuring out how to, you know, go back and say, all right, so I know, you know, I'm coming up with an experiment based off of like these four papers. Well, I can't just write a thesis with a lit review on only four papers. So then it's about how do you broaden this, you know, broaden the lens to say like, this is what goes into it, but then also keep that focus because it's very, very easy to just start kind of going everywhere. And not everything is relevant. And so that definitely was a struggle. And I can't even say that I really satisfactorily, obviously, I, I finished the, the master's and I finished the dissertation, but learning how to properly scope something is something I still struggle with. And I would say now with more experience in industry, scoping has become a little easier, but it, it is it is absolutely a challenge figuring out what is my question and then having to ruthlessly apply is this relevant? Yes, no. If no, move on to something else. Thank you for that. That, that definitely makes for that, that. That is great advice when it comes to having a conversation with your, your advisor early on about seeing where you can align both your interests as a student and their interests as a professional or an academic uh, faculty member. And um, you know, I've had experience with different advisors through my time as a graduate student, a PhD student now, and then a master's. And it really did depend on the advisor because some advisors are have a little bit different of an expectation about how much your work matches theirs or aligns with theirs. And so did you have different experiences with different advisors as you went through your program? Um, or did you feel like you had a lot of liberty to choose your topic when you were developing uh, your research questions? And that can go to any, any th of the three of you. Um, so I guess I can try to answer that. 
So in the biological sciences, we have one advisor, but that being said, we do have a committee and of about either four to five people. And so you are able to chat with them about different projects and every single year you do get to meet with them and revise your dissertation, so to speak. So I think that for this question, for me, what was most important was learning to be very flexible with my research topics. So I went in with an idea of what I wanted to study. Um, and I did sit down with my advisor as well, and then later on with my committee, and we talked about trying to formulate an idea of what my dissertation would be very early on. That's very necessary, <laughs> um, but not crucial. You can change it later on. Um, so from there, we were able to come up with an idea of what the dissertation would be. Um, but I would also add, in being flexible, you have to realize that research projects are going to fail, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You learn from that. You can include that as a side note in one of your chapters or in an appendix somewhere. It's not the end of the world. And in fact, it's pretty normal, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> but what is important is learning from all of these different mistakes that you make along the way and starting to build perhaps either on that same research topic or continuing on into another one that's somewhat similar. Um, I would highly advise on, you know, keeping it flexible, realizing research projects are gonna fail and that's fine. Talk to your committee members. They are a great resource. They will sit down and chat with you and gosh, they know all the papers <laughs> that have come out. So use them as much as possible. I'm so glad you brought up that, you know, scientific research projects can fail because I think that it can be easy to forget that that is a very natural and important part of the scientific process. I mean, if everything always worked out exactly how we wanted it to, then we probably wouldn't need science in the first place. So, you know, we're trying to solve problems and if projects fail, there's something to be gained from that and to be used as information for the next project. So. One thing that we can't fail on though is actually getting that thing written. And so Joy, you mentioned that uh, you set goals for writing a certain number of paragraphs per week and that you tried your best to make that happen each week. Are there any other strategies that you, Joy or Jessica, or I think we might've lost Shaima for a moment, but so either the two of you, what other strategies did you use to make sure those words were getting down on paper throughout the process? So, uh, Joy, you can take over if you want. Um, I joined writing groups and started tracking my time. So one of the, I can't remember the name of the book right now, but uh, I joined a writing group, I want to say, in my second year of graduate school. And it, it wasn't really until my third or fourth year that I really started participating. And I would say that that really started paying dividends for me, but I became introduced very early on to the idea of setting reasonable goals and just the importance of consistency. So just set a goal to write for 15 minutes a day, you know, four times a week, five times a week. And I think Joy also talked about the importance of being able to forgive yourself because you don't always make those goals. And it's easy for us, a lot of us in graduate school, a lot of us, you know, pursuing graduate degrees, we are highly motivated, high achieving individuals who, you know, set very high goals and standards for ourselves. And it's not easy when we fall short of those goals. But letting go of that all or nothing mindset and saying, okay, well, my goal was to write for 15 minutes, four times this week. And I made it for 15 minutes, three times. In fact, some of those times I wrote for 30 minutes, but I didn't make four times. Well, I still did all of that writing. That writing is still there. That experience, that skill building is absolutely still there. And to say, okay, well, that's fine. And then next week's another week and I'm just going to keep going and not giving up on yourself if you don't always meet goals, 
learning how to set goals effectively, because I can tell you as a psychologist that even though the you know, motivation wasn't my area, but I can tell you that if we keep missing our goals, it becomes incredibly demotivating. So when we set our goals too high, such that we can't actually achieve them, it really doesn't help us. It's better to start with small goals and make meet them or exceed them and just slowly increment up, but then also always being willing to say, okay, well, I got sick this week or, you know, like my car broke down and I was really stressed about it or, you know, these things happen, accepting that we're human and continuing to go forward. But I would say that definitely one of the biggest things for me was tracking the amount of time I spent. And by the end of graduate school, I had an Excel spreadsheet with, uh, since I'm a data geek, with three or four years worth of yearly data for every single day in the year of how many, you know, how much time in minutes I wrote. And then, it, you know, broke it down to how, you know, per month I wrote with this many days on average in actuality. And I had all these visualizations. And I will tell you the first year I kept that, it was hard. And the, but the second year was a little bit easier. And you, you kind of get on this track of saying, ooh, can I beat my goal? Can I get to where I was before earlier in the year? And it builds on itself. And the other half of it is that writing itself is a skill and all skills take practice. And you need, so sometimes you're gonna have a bad writing session. Sometimes you're gonna have a good writing session, just like you have a bad run or a good run or you know a bad bike ride or a good bike ride. All of these things are skills and that importance of massed practice, of repetitive practice and consistent practice is one of those things that you're gonna need, you're gonna rely on to get that dissertation done, to build that consistency and to build that skill. You will be a better writer by the end of the process as long as you keep at it. Um, can, Dustin, could you repeat the question so that we can get Shima's perspective? Absolutely. So, yes, thank you. Of course, yeah. So the question that I last asked was, what sort of strategies did you use to make sure that you were getting words down on paper consistently so that you finished on time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think... I think the most important strategy that I used to use was to um, make sure that reminding myself over and over that my first draft doesn't have to be perfect. Um, for me, I always, or at least, in, at least during my master's, when I was writing my first thesis, I thought that my first draft, my thesis, my first draft of my thesis is going to be this, this is what I'm going to submit to the grad college. I thought it's going to be perfect. This is um, all I've got to write. Uh, this is my best thing, the best thing I could, I could, I could, I could have ever done. Um, I got so attached to it. And then when I received the feedback from my advisor, I thought it's going to take like a couple of days of editing and then I'm done. Uh, but it actually took me a year to get done with my thesis. Uh, so what I learned to do is to remind myself over and over that the first draft doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, what I also did is that I used to... Uh, spend so much time perfecting my first draft because I thought that it was going to be it. Um, but yeah, um, this is the most important strategy I used to use. And I, I, I still, I'm still using everything that I'm writing now, even if I'm writing a paper, um, uh, a grant proposal, I just write anything in my first draft, like get it done, get the writing out and then the rest is going to be done. I think that's, oh, sorry, Joy, you go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, so strategies that I use to get words down on paper. Um, well, if we're being real here, the first strategy <laughs> that I had was I had to be in the right mindset to do it. <laughs> so I had to make sure that, okay, you kind of figure out what type of a writer you are. So I figured out I was a slow writer, but I also found out that I have to write when it is daytime. I'm, I just cannot write at night. Um, so I had to, so I figured out, okay, I'm most productive at writing at around, I don't know, sometime in the morning with my coffee. So I'd have everything set up, have the ambiance kind of nice and, you know, you just, <laughs> anything to help get those words flowing. But Yes, I also needed to make sure that I went in with an outline. So even if I just went in 
set up the ambiance to write and all I got down was an outline of what I needed to write for the upcoming week or what have you, I considered that as a win. Um, but it also helped me to organize things. And I think that was very important for me. So I would say, okay, this week I am very busy in the lab. I can get done with the materials and methods section because that's pretty straightforward. Or if there's a slow week for me in the lab, then I will focus on one part of the intro or the discussion, something along those lines. And there are some weeks that just were absolutely I was just slammed with things in the lab, so I would be perfectly happy with getting the citations done. <laughs> so <laughs> you just kind of take what you can get when it comes to writing. But as long as you're making some sort of progress and you do it on your own, you kind of figure out what type of writer you are and whatever is working for you, just keep at that. I really like the insights that you're all providing because I hear you saying that there is an importance to have a nice physical space in which to write that helps you actually write, you know, so the physical place in which you're going to sit or stand and write, and then also the right space inside your mind when it comes to approaching the writing task at hand. So doing things that you know helps you uh, prepare to get some, some things down and so did, are there any things specifically, I know you mentioned, Joy, you had to have your coffee and it was in the daytime, but any, anything uh, that, you know, Shaima or Jessica, you can add that um, you did when it came to your physical space or any kind of tools you used to stay focused and to write your dissertation? For me, I like to stay away from distractions. I like to have like a super quiet environment around me and just focus on writing. Uh, that makes me like get into this flow state very fast. Like sometimes um, it turns dark, like eight hours later, I don't feel the time. I don't feel anything around me. I didn't eat, I didn't drink, I'm just writing. So as long as it's quiet, um, I mean, everybody's different. Um, when it comes to physical space, some people like, somebody would like like some white noise around, somebody would like some, uh, a group around, just writing support. Um, but yeah, for me, I just like it, liked it quite. So my lab environment, I, I did most of my work while in the lab and our shared office space. Uh, I think at most we had eight people, um, but usually I had at least three or four other people in the room and we all had our kind of desk areas. So my secret weapon was my big old Sennheiser headphones over the ear, comfy foam, I could wear those guys for hours. Um, and so it's really two or three things that I, I had um, that would help me. One was a mug of tea because I am a tea drinker and, you know, I bring my loose leaf stuff and I, I, you know, make sure I had my cup of tea. I would have some sort of a timer, whether it be on my computer, on my phone, and I'd set it for the minimum amount of time or half of the minimum amount of time that I wanted to write. And then my rule was, is while I was writing, I had to only be writing. I couldn't be doing other things on the computer, other things on my phone, no answering texts, no nothing like that. I was focused on writing. And if I had to do something, it had to wait until the end of that timer. And then my headphones. So everybody kind of knew if Jess has her headphones on, it means leave her alone. She's writing, even though not everyone followed that rule. Um, and I would usually have, um, so the music on would be something I'd know very well so that my brain wouldn't have to fully pay attention to it. So whether it was later on, it was ambient kind of post-rocky sort of things enough at a quiet enough volume that or loudness level that it would gently block out other noises, but it would not be so loud that it was overstimulating and it would let me, it would kind of block out everything else. So I could also slip into that flow state where I was focusing on what was in front of me. Um, but the nice thing is, is that I could live without the tea and the timer could always be on my computer. So as long as I had headphones, I could write on a plane. I could write on a couch. I could write anywhere. Did I prefer to write at my desk? Absolutely. But I didn't let, I didn't let myself, because I, I did early on and I later realized 
the biggest, most important space is up here for me. And to not let the excuse of, well, I can't write because I'm not at my desk or I can't write because I'm not, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I can. My fingers work. My computer works. I can absolutely write. Even if it's only, you know, 15, 20 minutes, I can still get that writing done. And that was a big thing for me is learning how to say, you know what, get her done. I really like that because the, the get her done mentality and the idea of developing that consistent habit really does require being able to do that behavior consistently and being able to overcome some of the obstacles or friction that come up from our environment. So you described, Jessica, being able to write as long as you have those headphones, if it's on a plane or somewhere that you could be distracted. Now, it, it also, you both mentioned the flow state, both you, Jessica, and Shaima. So that reminds me or makes me think of that concept of deep work where we dedicate our time to one thing for a given period of time. You know, you mentioned, Jessica, using a timer. And so those are some things that um, not just using the timer, but then making sure that you're just focusing on that single task you set for yourself during that time. And in a different uh, session earlier today, we heard about the Pomodoro technique of setting a certain amount of time and before you decide to get up and take a break and then being dedicated. So I love the connections that are being made uh, in this workshop with some of the other things we've heard. Um, one thing that we that you mentioned a while back, Jessica, was a, a writing group. I believe you said that you were a part of a writing group. And so I wanted to ask both you and then the other panelists uh, about your experiences on that writing group. So. I feel like a writing group can be kind of elusive. Like we all hear we should be a part of a writing group, but we're not exactly sure, like, is it worth my time? Am I going to get something out of it? Am I going to be distracted only reading other people's work and not getting feedback? So I guess my question is, what was the best part of the writing group? What, and what were some of the obstacles to the writing group? And how did you try to overcome those? And I, I hope that um, I'm directing this question to more than just Jessica. I'm not sure if I heard either of you mention a writing group. Um, other than Jessica. I'll jump in first. Um, so I do want to mention, and I'm sure that this got covered, that there are different types of writing groups. There's kind of writing production groups where you sort of sit together and y'all write individually. There's writing feedback groups where you just give it feedback on each other's work. There's writing accountability groups, and then you can do any combination. So I've been part of the one I was the part of the longest was a combination feedback and accountability group. And then I've also been a part of a writing production group, but I'll mostly focus on the feedback and accountability group as it's the one I was part of for four, a good four years and actually post-graduation for a little while as well. Um, so we would start with accountability. So all of us had set goals for the week. We kind of went over them and did we achieve them? And we briefly talk about whether, you know, like if we didn't achieve our goals, we kind of talk with each other about like, well, what kept it, what stood in your way? Like how, why didn't you? And let's brainstorm things that maybe, you know, could fix it. I mean, obviously, you know, if your car broke down or you got sick, then obviously there's not much to fix there. But, you know, if it's like, well, I wasn't able to write because I just didn't feel motivation. Well, let's talk about motivation. Let's talk about this. So being able, having that accountability piece was so important because we all set goals, but sometimes, and this, Obviously, everybody varies, but I don't always keep, if I'm just making a promise to myself, I don't always keep it. Um, and so having other people that said, well, Jess, you said that you were going to write four times for 15 minutes and your fingers aren't broken and you didn't get sick. So what's going on? That helped that accountability piece. Um, and also hearing other people's struggles, just understanding that I wasn't alone, that everybody goes through these challenges, everybody has these ups and downs. That was so valuable too, that psychosocial support. And then going to the feedback portion. So what we did is we would bring three, a maximum of three double spaced pieces of paper. So usually it'd just be like two or three paragraphs or like a brief section. And we'd all spend 15 minutes reading in five, you get 20 minutes usually. And the person, the author could divide and, you know, we'd spend some time reading and giving editing. And then we'd talk through that feedback and they could specify. And learning how to edit other people's work, um, moving from just like copy editing of like, oh, you, you know, bad grammar or misplaced comma to more higher level things about seeing organization and seeing the same things that I was going through in my writing, but in other people's writing was so helpful to me. It helped me learn, okay, as a reader, this is what I see when like 
you know, the key idea of a paragraph isn't stated, or there's like multiple ideas in this paragraph, and maybe it should be broken up. And learning to edit other people's work made my writing better because I could apply that. And at the same time, uh, you know, you learn to love other people, quite frankly, doing your thinking for you. You take a piece of writing that you're kind of stuck with and you don't know where exactly it should go. And then you hand it to somebody else. And these people look at it and they can diagnose all the problems for you. And so looking at it that way, instead of seeing it as like you did something wrong, they're there to help you say, well, I couldn't quite understand this. And here's why. Or, you know, I think this is actually two ideas and this is why. And that helps so much as well. There were people who unfortunately were not able to sort of that, that saw that as a personal attack, unfortunately, but I finding a group that can do this and do this in a like friendly, you know, criticism isn't a bad word. You know, a lot of it is delivery. So I guess I should also say, make sure you can gel with the personalities in your writing group. Obviously, if you don't get along with somebody that I'm not sure you're going to get along in writing group. But as long as it's a, you know, the atmosphere is one of camaraderie, the atmosphere is one of like genuinely wanting to help each other. It, it really helps. A, you get this feedback before you even present it to your advisor or to the reviewer or whatever. And then also when you later get feedback from your advisor or your reviewer, you've had weeks, months, possibly even years of responding to feedback and criticism of your writing in real time. And it's so much easier for you to do that job of separating your work product from yourself, because that's one of the hardest things about that feedback with writing is it's so personal. Um, I think, was it Hemingway that said, you know, like writing's easy. We just sit at our typewriter and bleed. Um, you know, it's so personal. So sometimes it's hard to differentiate to like separate out our work product from our sense of self. But they're not the same. This is something I wrote. It's not me. And a criticism of like, I can't understand what you wrote is not a criticism of me, even though at first it feels like it. And writing group was so helpful for learning how to take that feedback how to use that feedback, how to do that sort of feedback for other people. And it just, I don't know, for me, it was incredibly helpful. Um, but your mileage may vary, so. For me, um, I, I work with the writing group when I was writing papers for conference. So uh, that was um, pretty cool. Uh, there were not a lot of um, participants, like uh, two or three, and um, basically we ha we had our writing done before meeting, and so when you met, it was more to organize the writings for the paper we were writing as a group, and uh, that was very cool. I don't know about... Uh, um sitting and writing with the writing group but i miss the peer review uh when i'm writing and i'm i i am pretty good on writing on my own on my time i'm a nocturnal person so after dinner when everybody goes away from me i do my thing and i go all the way to three even to the sun comes up if it's if is that a deadline and i set up a timelines and deadlines for myself because I work very productively when I'm under pressure, you know? So I set up my due dates <laughs> and uh, I, I like to do like a checklist and go checking out the thing, that did this, did that. Huh? But uh, when it comes to writing, I like to write and uh, I like to change things from here when I finish you know I I I kind of uh, um, change things from the bottom to to the middle depending on uh, this fits better here than there and uh, and uh, I I don't know uh, the experience of a writing with a writing group uh, because my experience in, with the writing group was pretty much that of um, a meeting to uh, organize uh, what you wrote before. Uh, so um, I, I don't know, 
but um, I really would like to connect with one to see how that goes. Um, maybe I, I like to be writing by myself and writing with the writing group, uh, but not just being like uh, with the writing group 100% uh, of um, the time. And uh, and the, what I really, really would like to is uh, to have a, a peer review of my writing, have a second opinion, see how you feel. Uh, like when I'm, uh, I'm preparing a survey on Qualtrics and I did various when I was working with my professors and by myself for uh, conferences, got IRB already for, but um, when I'm writing my own surveys, I like, uh, um, to see how it feels and flows, you know, um, to have, um, uh, oh, I wrote this and a series of questions. And so this person, oh, but I, I cannot answer this survey because I never went in a field trip, huh? You know, so uh, I have to, to use that um, um, participants who went in a field trip and participants who did not, go in a field trip. So, so that can split the survey in two sides and that will work better than uh, just have uh, people dropping out of my survey, you know what I mean? Cecilia, I I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask if you had a question. I heard you mention something about your experience with writing groups and you, I just wanted to maybe redirect us a little bit back to the writing groups because that was the topic. Uh, could you tell me if you had a question about the types of writing groups or like if you're asking the panel, you know, how to make it more effective? Uh, well, my question is how may I connect with the writing group? The writing group I participated, it was more to, um, to write conference paper you know, and uh, not write my thesis. And I'm in a teacher education um, program. So um, I wonder if anybody here is participating in a writing group and uh, if there's anything connected with the teacher education or if it's a eclectic writing group that uh, everybody can participate and how. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hear you asking a little bit about like, well, I don't, we, we might hear about something related specifically to the teacher education program, but what I think I might be hearing, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, I think the kind of the core of your question is like, how do I, how do I make a good writing group or how do I find one that serves my needs? Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, if it's there any, uh, because, uh, um, yeah, um, if it's a, a writing group available, that uh, um, Jessica knows because she is the one who has a very, very good experience with that and uh, can set up the pathway to heaven. So let's see. <laughs> Jessica. So the one I was in was started in the psychology department by uh, Professor Kim Barchard and was directed at psychology graduate students However, I also participated in the Rebel, Grad Rebel Writing Boot Camp twice. I was in the first one and I think actually the second one. Uh, and I remember at least then this, of course, this is, you know, pre-COVID times and we were all meeting in the same room. But as part of the writing boot camp experience, like we actually all signed that, you know, like we were trying to form like so we were using each other to try to set up writing groups. Some stayed, some didn't. Um, but I found most effective for me was uh, just trying to set one up with other graduate students in my program. Um, so beyond, in terms of the writing production, the one that I was a part of, that was grad student led. So whether you have like a listserv for your own graduate students in your department, or um, you could actually put out a call on, I don't remember what it's called anymore, like UNLV Today or uh, like, you know, but there, there's the mailing list. So you could always take the initiative to send out and say, I'm looking to start a graduate writing group. Uh, I don't, sorry, I've been out for a couple of years, so I don't know what, <laughs> you know, social networking available, there is available, but a lot of it was, if you don't already have one in your department, then go out and start one. That's the biggest thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I can check it out if they have one. Uh, what I noticed is that uh, 
since pandemics, uh, everything is going pretty much remotely, you know, even classes became uh, hybrid. It always was hybrid, but more spaced uh, meeting time. It's normally at the beginning of the semester and then at the end, something like that. But uh, the writing boot camp, yeah, I've been here um, um, a year before. They helped me out so much to go through my uh, uh, comps, and I was very successful. Thanks so much for everyone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I like this time set to write, and uh, normally we were writing on our own, you know. And uh, yeah, so, but uh, I'm going to check with my de department. Um, and uh, and see, uh, it's been pretty quiet there, uh, you know. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you, Cecilia, for that question and and getting us to think a little bit more about writing groups. And I know that Chima and Joy, you haven't had the chance to talk on this top topic yet. So, is there anything you wanted to add? And it's okay if not, but anything you wanted to add about writing groups? Um, I guess just very briefly, because I know that we're running out of time, I for sure would recommend forming a writing group within your department with fellow graduate students, because writing, unfortunately, can become very specific, field specific. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes the best people to review your papers or what have you are the ones that are sitting right next to you in your classes. And I mean, I, I, I think that that helped me the most was asking my fellow graduate students, hey, if I buy you a coffee, can you just look over this paper real quick and just give me your most blunt and honest review, just rip it into shreds, just red ink everywhere, um, and I'll buy you a venti Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, that helped the most for me. I like that three. That's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you for that. And then, Shaima, did you have anything else? I didn't really get a chance to join any writing groups. I, I always had my own office, no office mates. And I was part of a research team uh, that worked up in the UNR. And I was the only one working in Las Vegas. So I had to work in my own all the time. It worked for me. I, I like quiet time. For my writing um so the, the only person who would edit and review my writing was my advisor and my research team up in reno but during writing i was always um i just didn't get the chance to join a writing group my only writing group that i joined was the writing boot camp back in 2017 um <laughs> i was working on um a grant proposal and i, I got it done i mean the support was fantastic. I just got it done. And it was very inspiring just to keep writing even after 5 p.m. when we finish the day. Uh, I would just keep writing till night. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I do see that we are running short on time. And I want to be respectful of all of your time and also especially the panelists. So I'd like to ask one more question to give the panelists uh, a final say on something I think that uh, will be helpful for everyone. And this relates to a question that you all, the panelists read before this as they were preparing, but it's a little bit of a modified question. So the original question was like, what strategies would you um, have adopted earlier in your graduate career to make the writing process uh, more effective or efficient? Uh, you can either answer that question or this one, like what would you go back and tell yourself as you started the dissertation process to make your life easier uh, as you were going through. And I I'd love to hear from all three of you, if you don't mind, before we wrap up today's session. I think it can start. Um, for me, I, I love geology. I loved what I was doing. I love research. Um, so I was getting involved in so many research projects at the same time that I didn't get time to write in the beginning, like early in my, uh, uh, early in my degree. Um, if I go back in time, I would just focus on one project at a time and get it written. And then 
and then move to the next project, like not do all of them together and then keep the writing till the end. This is what I did, that I kept the writing till the end. It also worked for me because we had to spend a couple of years at home, I think, um, because of the pandemic. But I mean, in a regular time, you wouldn't get this chance again, I think, ever. Um, so yeah, just start writing from the beginning. If you like to focus on one project, just do it. Just get get it written. Get something written early in your program. If I could go back and tell myself what to do five years ago when I started it, I would say, so obviously your research projects can change because sometimes the science just doesn't work out and that's fine. But I think in about year two or three, you have a decent idea of what your project is going to be. And I think at that point in time, especially year two, you should start. And if you, if you didn't start year two, start now. <laughs> um, start looking at other people's dissertations, especially those that are within your field and especially those that came out of your lab. <laughs> That's really important because then you'll get an idea of how your advisor um, likes to format the dissertations because you'll find that dissertations are not just field specific but also advisor specific. On top of that, they then have to get approved by the grad college. So there's a lot of different steps and tiers that you have to bypass. So I would have one looked at a bunch of different dissertations from previous students, seen how it was formatted, seen what I needed to put into it research wise. Um, typically it's about three big projects or so. Um, and then continuing from there in year three or four, I would have started to write the manuscripts. So in those years, I did get a little bit lucky and I started to write manuscripts then. But just as a <laughs> piece of advice, try to start your manuscripts if you can a little bit earlier. And it's fine if it's just something that may never get published because you know what? Sometimes you can just slide that into your dissertation regardless. Just take different chunks of paragraphs out and put it into some of those chapters to see if it can get published. But yes, for sure, my number one tip would be go back. Make sure you know what a dissertation entails. Make sure you look at other dissertations from your lab in particular. And talk to your advisor. Say, hey, I want to start thinking about this now. Let's get a plan going. They may say it's a bit early, but just, you know, just keep asking. Now, I do have a quick question before you all gone. And uh, that's a, uh, maybe you can answer me, Joy. Uh, is that... Um, Better to write your manuscript on Google Docs, uh, Google Forms, or you prefer on Word to make the tracking and uh, keep, um, you know, keep it documented from the beginning to whatever you, you go into. Yeah, that's a great question. So I like to keep it in Word and so that I could keep the tracking but also so that I could save the different revised versions each and every single time so that I would have a very hard copy of, okay, here are the comments that my advisor gave to me on this date. And they wrote it in, so they can't say otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Um, but s just so that I would have a hard copy of everything as I went along. And sometimes when you get really far in your writing, you realize, that you had cut out big paragraphs or what have you, and you think, oh, I really like the way I had written it four months ago, right? You can use it, yeah. Exactly, right. Great, great. And uh, when you save uh, the new copy, do you change the date? Every time. Absolutely. Every time I change the dates, and I will initial so that I know if, I, if that's my version of the manuscript or if it's okay. my advisor or whoever. Mm -hmm. So if your advisor send you a, a review of your manuscript with the, his initials yes. and you send back to him, you put your initials after his initials, uh, you save it? No, I, I started it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Then I use my initials, yeah. 
appreciate that so <laughs> very much so because i've been doing this so long and uh, uh you know i'm just doing because i gotta get done but it's a proper way to get done thank you very much good luck to you you're gonna do great hasta la vista baby <laughs> thank you and then jessica did you have anything else you wanted to add um, just sort of to echo, start writing early, but also start writing from the beginning of a project. That's something I wish I have like five papers worth of data and I didn't write, start writing. Cause I, I also did the same thing where I had a ton of projects cause I just love doing the projects and I didn't love writing them up. So start writing from the beginning of the project, slap down your idea, write down the methods, write out your rough results. It doesn't ever have to see the light of day, but that way, when you do go back and start writing a manuscript, you have already started the writing and it's writing. It counts. Uh, it, um, you're allowed to write bad first drafts, as was said before. It is absolutely okay. In fact, it's preferred because you wrote something. And then the other thing would be, for me, I was always like, what do I put in this document? And so outlines didn't work for me because I'm like, well, I don't even know what I'm writing. How can I write an outline if I have no idea what I'm doing? So something I've learned since then is actually kind of outlining in forms of questions. You start out by saying, what do I, what do we know about this? What do we know about that? What do we know about this little question here? And then as you are going through, that turns into your outline. You sort of, you have a sort of organization, but it's okay not to know the answers at first because that's the whole thing is you don't know the answers at first. So you can absolutely start your outline in question form and then later it'll become answers. And I wish I had known that from the beginning. That and just write, sit your butt in the chair, write. It'll never become, e it'll never be fun necessarily, but it absolutely becomes easier. Thank you so much for that final advice. And yeah, I think I heard you say earlier, you mentioned, you quoted Ernest Hemingway with, you know, sitting in front of a typewriter and bleeding. A, another one I've heard from him is every first draft is junk, but I won't, it's actually not junk. It's a different word I won't say on this workshop. So um, it's, it's reassurance for all of us to work hard to get those words down consistently and revise. So. I know we're two minutes past our time, so I just want to reiterate how grateful I am to our panelists for not only spending your time with us, but sharing your expertise and then even talking about some of the vulnerabilities that come with being a student and pursuing a terminal degree. It's incredibly challenging, but you all completed it and you give us hope of doing the same thing. And I also want to thank all of our other guests for making time to come to this workshop during the Grad Rebel Writing Bootcamp. We appreciate you not just coming, but also being engaged and we will meet you all back over in Remo, which is the, the platform. I'm not sure if the panelists are aware, but that's our platform we're meeting in. So I didn't want that to confuse you. But um, We will be posting this workshop on the Grad College YouTube channel, as I mentioned, so you can see it there at a later time. And I just want to say thank you one more time. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.